All right, it's half past. Um, I have about 150 slides, so we should probably make sure we start early. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to show you all the amazing buzzwords you, buzzwords you always wanted to hear in a single talk. UEFI, GWAP, and U-Boot all at the same time. Isn't that awesome? Um, so who am I? I'm uh, Alexander Graf. I work for SUSE. Um, I, my official position really is uh, a virtualization developer. I usually don't get around to um, do embedded hardware uh, things in, in my official assignment. Good thing is that I don't stick to my official assignments, um, so I end up doing a lot of ARM work, which is what is down here. I'm basically one of the founding members of the SUSE ARM team. So uh, back a couple years ago, four years or so roughly, um, we sat down together and moved up to a position where we said SUSE should be in the ARM business, which means we should also be in the embedded business a bit more. Um, and uh, figured out ways and, and worked on, started working on things that uh, made us move towards that path, and this is one of the outcomes of, of that work. <clears throat> so how does booting on ARM work? Booting on ARM um, is a story full of mysteries. Uh, it basically starts off uh, with your boot ROM. So you have a boot ROM, can you hear me well? All right, awesome. Um, you have a boot ROM in your, in your CPU, which runs very target-specific code. It runs basically your SOC-specific code in there. That's what that symbol symbolizes. Um, and it's really only there to boot some other small stage of bootloader, um, or even bigger stage of bootloader. Basically, eventually, you're getting to, a, um, to some kind of firmware, to something that um, whoever puts assembles a board, um, puts on the, on the system, uh, to describe how that board works, to bring it up initially so that the operating system can take over. Um, and that is also very target specific code because you obviously need to initialize a board and so you need to know what that board looks like. And then you have an operating system running on top um, which may or may not be target specific. Um, and the handover part over here, that's basically the main piece we're, we're talking about. Um, that one today is either some custom protocol, uh, external configuration files, vboot, UEFI. I'm sure there are plenty more out of there um, of ways how to get from firmware all the way down to your operating system. Um, now, me as an operating system person, uh, I, I don't care about all of this over here, really. I mean, I, sure, I did patches and I do work on it to improve it, um, but from a from a user's point of view, if I want to use an operating system, I, I don't want to have to care which board I'm running that operating system on. I just only want to plug it in and have it work and, and not worry about which hardware platform I'm on. This is me coming from a server and, and desktop -y background, I guess. Um, it's very different in this audience. <laughs> but um, this is the expectation that our users, our customers have. Um, also, all the stuff down here, all that craft, um, is very annoying if you want to have a um, single, if, if you really want to have a universal image, you, you can support every single boot method that is out there in that one image. It's, it's sheer impossible. We tried. <laughs> Believe me, we tried. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't doable. Um, so we really want to have one single protocol and then just be done. Have one operating system, have one single protocol to talk to your firmware, leave firmware to others, and we're happy. Right? Then we, we are universal and we are, we are all, all fine off um, on, on what we're doing. So to understand um, how we could potentially get there, let's take a look at what the UEFI boot flow looks like. So um, I'm going to explain what UEFI is later, but um, the boot flow um, is uh, basically the example, set, set example on, on how to do it generically because x86 solved all that years ago, right? I mean, they, they, they do know what they're doing if they want to boot Windows on every system out there. So you have your firmware, which is UEFI compliant. And that firmware then goes in and um, looks at NVRAM, which contains a boot list, a boot order, um, and it just has a couple of files that it can boot from on that boot order. So it goes to that list and tries to find um, the first file in that boot order. If it can't find it, it goes to the second file in that boot order. If it can't find it, it goes to the third file of the boot order. The important piece is the boot order is not just the device. It actually is a device and a file, usually. It's, actual, it's, it's an actual path. <clears throat> Now, if none of these boot paths work, and that's important for us here, if none of these boot paths work, then we're in the fallback case, in which case we have um, something called removable boot, um, which, was, which was originally intended for things like USB sticks and CD-ROMs, where you did not know beforehand what you're going to boot. You're just plugging it in, and it should work. 
which is basically what we're trying to do on ARM systems. Right? You should plug it in and it should work. So this is really what we're trying to model. Um, that removable medium uh, stuff basically has a predefined file name. So it's per architecture. You have different file names that are default. But um, it searches on every one of those devices that it knows of. It searches for, a, um, for that file name. It's as simple as that. It goes in and searches, do I have that file name on my disk? No, I don't. Do I have it on my SD card? No, there's no SD card plugged in. Do I have it on a CD-ROM that's plugged in somewhere? Yes, I do. Awesome. Next step. Next step is um, we are booting our payload. This is, just in case you can't see it, this is the new amazing beta type logo of Grub. So, crap. Um, so we, we're booting our, our payload, we're loading it from, from, our, from our storage, we're booting it, um, it uh, goes in and then um, that payload receives a, a thing called EFI runtime data. It's basically just a pointer. So it, similar to how Linux gets the device tree as a pointer when you boot it, um, in an EFI world, uh, the EFI payload gets the EFI runtime data uh, as, as the payload, as the, as the reference um, it can use to, to then further on figure out what it should do. EFI runtime data contains um, really just four main things. It contains console support, boot services, runtime services, uh, and tables. Console is self-explanatory, I would guess. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows what a, what a console is. But, um, wait, that's one slide too much. All right, uh, but the, um, the, the thing that uh, we're going to use over here, oh, no, that's not, sorry. Uh, too much animation, there you go. Um, using this runtime data, we now have a bi-directional um, communication channel between firmware and our payload. That's the important piece. So um, you get this runtime data, our firmware, into our, our EFI binary goes and uses that runtime data to have callbacks back into UEFI, so we have a bi-directional channel established and thereby we can do callbacks, we can actually communicate with our firmware and make use of our firmware to do other things, like, for example, boot services, which provide us objects that we can use to access devices that our firmware knows about. So EFI, for example, has awareness of a, what a block device is, right? And it, if, it, it provides you interfaces to talk to block devices um, using the, uh, some special protocols, but basically using the boot time services. Um, so this piece of code can now go in and read data from this block device, but it doesn't have to use the file system, for example, from, from, uh, from your firmware. It can easily implement its own. So for example, here, Grub can just go in and implement its own ButterFS support, but use the block layer of UEFI to then, say, load the Linux kernel and run that one, which again is an EFI binary, in case you didn't know, Linux kernel is a UEFI binary. Um, that one <clears throat> also gets this bi-directional channel to UEFI, and so that one's running as a UEFI binary now. So now we're getting to the really interesting piece of, of UEFI. It has this thing called, um, called exit boot time services, exit, exit boot services, um, where it basically just tells EFI, go and kill everything that's not me, uh, because I'm taking over the machine now, and I don't want you to control the hardware anymore. I want to do all that control. It's called Cryisk on, on Power, for example, in case you've ever worked on that one. There's usually a call in firmware where the operating system can say, all right, now I'm taking over. So that one also exists in UEFI, but UEFI still keeps a memory, still keeps around a bit at least, some, some pieces, um, to provide runtime services. So runtime services are something that um, Linux can call into while it is executing. So you have Linux running and everything's there, but some pages in memory still contain ex executable code um, that Linux can call into uh, to have other services provided. For example, so the three most important ones are in VRAM, you can modify the boot order. Um, it has uh, one real-time clock support so that you don't have to re-implement real-time clock drivers for every single system out there and your board can specify which one it is and how to access it. And it supports uh, reset and, and shutdown services. So you just say, EFI, I, I want to shut down the system and that's it. Um, you don't have to implement that for every single system out there either. So those three are the, the main, main pieces in the runtime services. 
Now, why why is EF, UEFI any? I mean, why do we have any benefit um, from using UEFI over our traditional boot protocols that we that we do have on the embedded world? Right? I mean, they're standardized. They have been there forever. They're good. Well, there's a few things that actually um, make life a lot easier for us. Um, the first and most important thing to me is we basically create a bubble around our firmware thing there, right? We have a standardized interface all the way over here and create another bubble, which is what the user provides on the other end. That means that any value add that we have now, which is not in our firmware, does not have to be in firmware. We can just modify the thing that comes with our operating system and add something to it that was not in, in UEFI before. So UEFI by default um, does not dictate any uh, file system support except for VFAT. Well, good luck booting off a VFAT partition. It, it works, but it's a really big mess if you're a standard stock distribution. We really want to boot from ButterFS, for example. So if you want to boot from ButterFS, we just put grub into a FAT partition where it can lie around and do whatever it wants. But that one just loads a ButterFS module internally, uses that to load the kernel, and we have booted off of ButterFS. Or we can boot off of ZFS. Or we can boot off of an X4 partition that happens to have 64-bit capabilities enabled <coughs> with a broken U-boot. All of these um, would are basically fixable by the distribution because the distribution is the one providing the file system. So why shouldn't the distribution be the one providing the file system driver just at the same time, right? Basic, the rationale is you have a line down here where this comes from a completely different entity than this here. And that's basically the main, main difference between the traditional embedded market that um, we've seen. One really, really amazing value add that our product managers just love is this. You have a graphical boot menu. Isn't that awesome? You can display logos. Yeah, I know, nobody really cares. But um, <laughs> apart from it being graphical, having a boot menu is actually really, really useful. Because you can go in, edit the command line on the command line, and just hack away, which is maybe not what you need for your typical embedded device, which runs as an appliance. But during development, it comes in incredibly handy to be able to modify the command line using just a couple of keystrokes. right? Um, another really interesting thing is that uh, you, you, if you're thinking out of the box, um, the first guys that I've seen that adopted uh, the UEFI boot was actually not us. I mean, I, I pushed all that code uh, upstream, but the first ones that I've seen using it were the FreeBSD ones because they had the same problem. They, they need to have their own bootloader, which then runs something off of ZFS or their own whatever, I don't know. And they want to be able to boot FreeBSD on ARM64 systems. So they just jumped on board, ported their bootloader to, to UEFI, and they're using that on, on, on ARM64 these days, which is actually pretty cool. Um, one thing you also should always keep in mind when, um, well, I mean, this is really important to us. It might become important to you, is that um, this allows for compatibility. So <clears throat> the same image now runs on all those systems out there, right? Because we added that bar, we basically try to move all of the hardware specifics out of our image that we're actually deploying. That same image now can run on a random server system or just the same on, on an embedded target. So you, you suddenly have an image that is universal, and if you really do need to switch to a different type of hardware, you can, depending within the scope and the limits of what you're trying to do, obviously, right? But it just makes life easier to switch to new things because you're not locked in that heavily. So what is UEFI? UEFI is a specification. I know a lot of people think UEFI is an implementation. It's not. It's a specification. It's a gigantic, enormous document with lots and lots of interestingly, interestingly written text um, that describes how to implement different interfaces. About 5% of these are interesting, really, and useful. Um, and Intel basically started this as EFI and then gave it to the open, um, started a consortium called UEFI Consortium, um, and the newer specifications are all called UEFI. So if I say EFI, forgive me, I really mean UEFI because UEFI is everything that people use these days. So UEFI has a reference implementation, and that one's called Tiano Core. If you've ever seen an EFI system that's either Tiano Core based 
or some homegrown implementation of, of a commercial distribution. So I don't know. I don't. I don't even know if AMI, for example, uses Tiano Core. Um, I would doubt they do it. They might use some parts parts of it, um, but. Tiano Core is the reference implementation that basically Intel uses to verify whether their spec is sane and how to and, and to control that people can develop against something that is that is widely um, available. So why do we need another implementation of the same thing? Why do we need to have U-Boot suddenly involved as well and add the same interfaces to yet another bootloader? I mean, what's the what's the point? I, I see Tom grinning. Um, I, I'm using I, I'm using that logo throughout. It's, it's I just really found it very cute. Um, <laughs> So uh, Tiano Core, the first and foremost reason for me personally, um, if you've ever looked at the code, it does not follow, how do you say this? Um, it does not follow coding style guidelines that I embrace. Um, how do you, politically correct? Um, <laughs> this is the most readable code I found in all of Tiano Core, just so you're aware. I I've at first tried to find another function which didn't fit on the screen even, which did basically the same thing as the, that U-boot function, um, which follows just normal standard Linux coding style, right? I mean, this is readable code. It's not the most readable code ever because we have to have these EFI entry and EFI exit macros to save a register. Um, but apart from these, um, it, it's all just normal, linked together, proper code, just the same way as you would expect it to, to look like. So. If you've ever wondered what, how EFI works, um, just maybe if you got stuck on reading Tiano Core code, try and read the U-Boot code, it's much easier. Um, then one really big, amazing difference that I found doing developing it is that um, if, you, if you would be a normal developer and you want to call, say, something from one C file to another C file or module, some, something inside your code base, and you want to call into some other piece of, the, of, the, of your code base, what do you do? Right? Usually you, you have a symbol and you call into it. Not so in Tiano Core Land. In Tiano Core Land, you first call a broker that gives you a handle that allows you to then do an indirect function callback into your other module so that you build amazing black boxes around every single piece of code that you're writing. Yes. This makes everything incredibly hard to understand. If you're trying to follow the path, what you're actually calling, it usually stops at the point where you're trying to do that indirect reference to some other module, and you just have no idea where that comes from, because there's no, no direct linking inside the same code base. Whereas in U-Boot, again, same as Linux, it's one big monolithic thing that just linked together which makes it much more readable and debuggable. You just attach CDB, you see function traces, everything just works the way you would expect it to. C scope, bam, um, done. <clears throat> so, um, and last but not least on, on the, on the um, important pieces that make U-Boot very different from, from Tiano Core is that Tiano Core is meant as the core. It's even, set, I mean, it even says so in its name, right? It's meant as this small piece that implements a few reference systems, reference designs, um, so that it shows that it actually can run something, but it does not want to include every single board support in one code base. Instead, it wants you to fork it. It wants you to fork special board support into a different repository. Live now finally went ahead and actually got fed up with that and created something called Open Platform Package, where he has an amazing five, I think, boards supported now. But um, that doesn't solve the problem that you still have to somehow merge code back all the time and you don't have one code repository where you can develop interfaces in lockstep and, and keep things internal because in Tiano Core nothing is internal. It's just they, they basically drove themselves into a corner um, where it's really hard to improve their code base. Whereas U-Boot, well, I'm just letting numbers speak, but that board support is not even remotely com comparable to Tiano Core. By enabling Tiano Core, you, you basically get yourself on a few systems out there. By enabling U-Boot, well, you conquer the world, right? It's a different league. So comparing those two, um, you can see that it makes a lot of sense to enable U-Boot um, because, I mean, I want to, I like the U-Boot code base. I really like to, to hack on it. Um, it's very hackable. It's understandable. Um, if you need to modify it, you can modify it. Um, 
I see a lot of reason to have a standardized boot path that allows me to boot my distribution with the same way I always do it on other implementations of firmware, um, but in a hackable manner, in hackable fashion, and like proper Linux E kind. So what do UEFI interfaces look like? It was always abstract, right? You have these objects and you have things there. So UEFI interfaces, um, let's take a look at, at um, objects. So UEFI basically gives you um, objects. This is, this is a disk object, a, a block object, and, and a CD object, and a network object. Uh, and every object is aware of um, its parents. So it has a full parent and, and child hierarchy. So this, for example, is an HCI controller. And you have an HCI controller object that you can talk to, that you can poke through and find the PCI bus of that HCI controller and whatever. Um, it's, it's a full, full hierarchy with everything included. You can even have children there. You can have a file system object or a file system driver creating object uh, attached to your block device again and a partition layout object and whatever. Um, each of these objects have uh, callbacks and properties, fields, whatever your name of the day is. Um, that happens both for block as well as for network. So each of them have uh, callbacks that you can use to basically send packets or read data. Um, and they just describe some layouts like what is the sector size. Right. Um, now, in U-Boot, on the other hand, um, we do also have objects, but we don't have a tree, right? We, we, don't, we don't have this hierarchy. We just have objects for specific endpoints, which is good enough. You don't really need to traverse trees uh, externally. Um, but we also have these callbacks. We have uh, every, every, of the, every one of these objects basically knows like what its size is. Like the block device, for example, knows its size. It knows. Uh, it knows sector sizes, it, know, it, can, it, it's, it has callbacks to read things, it has callbacks to write things. It looks the exact same. Right? It's basically, if you leave away the hierarchy part, the actual objects that we care about, they're the same thing, just with a different semantic. And what you usually do when you have different semantics, basically different languages, is you just write translations to them. Right? You basically just write a small, you, you, can, you can basically can translate from, from U-boot interfaces to UEFI interfaces very, very easily with really little code. You just implement the UEFI callback and call the U-boot callback, and that's it. Right? They might not have the same parameter names, but it's very, very little code. And all of that is in U-boot upstream called EFI loader. It's in slash lib slash EFI, EFI loader. Um, and it basically just goes and converts from one thing to the other. All there is to it. Very simple, very, very, very little code, really very little code if you want to look at it. Now, we can basically talk EFI, but how do we get this binary to even run? Right? So we, we, we now know how to, how to talk interfaces to, to an application, but we need to somehow get an application running as well. And that's where boot EFI comes into place. So we already have things like boot Z, boot M, boot I, whatever on, on your boot. So now we also have one more thing called boot EFI. So what boot EFI does, is um, it basically, uh, or what you do when you want to use bootify is you at first have your memory and you somehow need to get your binary into that memory from your storage, just like you do with the normal boot flow that you have on, um, on boot Z, boot I, whatever you want to call them, um, for a normal traditional U-boot. So you take that, um, you, you use that normal load command, which U-boot implements, to take your payload and move it into RAM. Done. Same as always in U-Boot. It's the same thing, really. Everybody's just doing that. And now what you can do is, now you can tell U-Boot, go ahead and execute that binary with this device tree that I'm giving you. You can also leave out the device tree if you don't want to pass a device tree. At which point, U-Boot goes in, runs the, uh, once the, well, in this case it's Linux, right? Once the Linux uh, EFI stop, which then runs Linux, and you're booting off. <clears throat> so it basically, if you're running this on a Raspberry Pi 3, which I just had lying around as a QEMU target, um, it basically looks like this. So you would uh, load something from your storage. You would load your, your kernel image from storage. You uh, load the device tree. You modify the device tree so that it contains a working command line argument field in there. So just FTT chosen basically updates the uh, current device tree, and then you boot it, and it boots up. It, it's running Linux now, 
And there we go. Now it's switched to graphics mode, and you're just booting up. And obviously, it doesn't find a root device because we didn't pass it any. But it's the same as any other boot method you have in uBoot. It doesn't differentiate between them. It looks the same. One really amazing thing um, that this allows us to do is um, that now Linux is actually has this bi-directional interface to your firmware. So what Linux can do now is it can go in and talk to, for example, a random number generator driver in UEFI, which then allows it to relocate itself to a random location in memory and implement KSLR this way. So if you want KSLR support, you right now need to have UEFI support. And I'm sure there's going to be more features like this coming where Linux just more and more depends on having this bi-directional interface to firmware available. So having a boot EFI path, even in trivial cases, does make a lot of sense because it doesn't actually give you any downside over a boot I path, for example. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, as a distribution, I don't want to type load something from SD card and boot EFI, that parameter there all the time. So there was a really amazing, um, there was some really, really amazing work in, in UBoot upstream called Distribute um, like a couple years ago um, that basically gives us a standardized boot method. So Distribute describes just boot targets that it wants to boot from. So you have this variable in, um, in your UBoot environment you can modify it if you really want to. You can just fizzle them, you can change them, save and, and then you boot from a different device. And for each of those devices, it tries to find a valid boot, boot target, boot file that it can boot from. So in our case, we're trying to boot from a block device, so it tries to search for an Xlinux conf, for a boot script, and for um, an EFI payload. Uh, this talk is not about Xlinux or boot scripts, so we're only focusing on how the EFI boot then is implemented. So the EFI boot um, basically goes in and looks at your storage device. It tries to find if you actually have one at first. Um, and if you have one, uh, it looks at your partition table. And it assumes that the first partition on the partition table is your EFI system partition. So your EFI system partition, in case you've ever worked on an EFI x86 system, is just a fat partition usually um, that stores your payloads, your grub, for example, the thing I was referring to earlier. So we're using that same partition because in most cases, that is your first partition. You can, you, the UEFI specification allows you to have it in a different place, but you would just ignore that part right now. So we take that partition, and then uBoot also has awareness um, of what your device tree is called. So there's a device tree dollar device FTT file um, parameter, <coughs> FTT file um, environment variable <coughs> that describes what the file name for your specific board for a device tree would be. So it searches for that file on these standard locations so that if your first partition, for example, is your root file system, which happens to have a slash boot path, which happens to have a boot DTB path, you could then just poke your device trees in there and it would automatically find them and use them. That's the idea, at least. It also goes and tries to search for our removable media path. So you saw this thing earlier where you have the boot ordered um, EFI files and then later on the removable path EFI files. Um, and this is basically um, the ARM64 removable path, which is the one I'm just using as an example, but it also supports the other architectures. Yes, please. Is that signed? The question is, is that signed? Um, let me come back to that after we're done. Um, Signing is its own topic. Uh, doable, not implemented. So that binary can then, for example, just be uh, our friend grub, which distribute and executes, and there we go. We have uh, booted, right? <clears throat> In a nutshell, on a Raspberry Pi 3 exa example again, um, because it just was just there in QEMU, um, it looks like this. You basically have auto boot, um, timeout. That one searches for your um, for for a file. It finds one. It boots into Grub. Grub loads all its files, shows your graphics, and well, this is actually a genuine SP2 ISO um, booting off on a stock Raspberry Pi 3, basically right now. 
Um, Grab then can load the kernel, can load an init ID, can boot the kernel, can boot the normal operating system, just the way it does on any other, any other architecture um, out there. Same difference. Not gonna show you until it, it's gonna take forever, it's all emulated on x86 system. So we have um, SD cards uh, implemented now. We can boot from them, so we're all good, right? Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> we distribute our distribution using ISOs. And a lot of people out there also want to do network boot, so we also need to support these things. So how does distribute work on these? ISOs is pretty simple. Um, there was a hack from, I don't know, I think it was, it definitely was before 2000. Um, from some uh, PowerPC forks. I don't know if it even was called Freescale at the time already. Um, who figured, you know, my ISO is really just like this big file which has El Torito pieces in them which contain my uh, payloads to boot from. So it can contain multiple of these, which means I really just have this thing that can be segmented into multiple other pieces which kind of reminded them of a partition table. So what they did is they implemented an amazing module into U-Boot that basically just exposes an ISO as a partition table so that each partition is an El Torito image inside of that um, partition table. Which means our first partition now is the EFI system partition which we can load our device tree and our grub from. Done. So all of that is already in, in there since 2016, 03 or so. So it's stable code by now. <clears throat> so Isoboot works, awesome. Actually the demo I just showed you was Isoboot. So, uh, now the only thing we have left is network boot. And network boot's interesting. So network boot, um, there are two different boot methods in, um, in, in distro boot. There's pixie boot and DHCP boot. Pixie boot is, um, X Linux specific, so I'm not gonna go into that. Um, the HCP boot, however, um, is basically what you would usually con refer to as Pixie boot or as network boot. So the HCP boot, the DHCP boot, um, your U boot goes in and sends a DHCP request to a DHCP server. And along that also passes a, t a hint, a token, that says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm an EFI payload running or I'm an EFI system running on this architecture using the VCI, that's the vendor something specific interface in, in, the, um, in the DHCP request. So the DHCP server can figure out which file it should return. So it returns a file name property in its ACK, which we can then use to download that from a THCP, TFTP server and, well, execute it, right? Done. Too fast? Good? All right, awesome. So network boot is all settled and done and upstream and works. It basically works the same way as it does on an actual Tiano core system. So if you have, or an AMI firmware or whatever, so if you have a, a working Pixie boot implementation, network boot implementation um, for EFI in your network, it will just pick it up and work. So what are EFI tables? So I, I described earlier on that we have um, console, uh, that we have uh, console, boot services, runtime services, and tables. So we covered all of the other pieces. We con well, we didn't cover the console, but that's obvious. Um, we, did, we covered what boot services are, that's all the objects. We covered what runtime services are, that's your NVRAM runtime configuration and reset and such. Um, so what are tables? Tables are basically just pointers to binary blobs with a UUID prepended to them. That's all tables are. So tables is like this list of things that you can, um, that you just pass to the operating system and say like, go, go and eat it. You can um, have, for example, device tree in there, you can have ACPI tables in there, you can have SM BIOS tables in there. Um, there are a bunch of tables uh, that basically just describe things that you pass to the operating system as blobs. Now, <clears throat> U-Boot uh, does not today implement ACPI. If anybody wants to implement that in a U-Boot environment, be my guest. <laughs> I don't know why you would want to do that, but um, it's possible, right? You, you can describe your hardware using ACPI tables if you want to test something or you want to verify whether your system works on both. It's doable. However, one thing that is actually really cool with those tables is that um, 
you're moving your, um, your device tree information all the way back into your firmware, right? because firmware now has to populate your device tree before your bootloader goes in and, and selects anything. So this does not leave any excuse to device trees um, that are kernel specific, because you can only have one. You can't have different device trees depending on which kernel you choose. Which actually is a good thing, I think, because it finally pushes device tree people into being compatible. Yay. Um, so another really amazing aspect, aspect is that, um, well, U-Boot can also use device trees to configure itself. So one thing that you can do, and which is implemented today, is that you can just use U-Boot's device tree, pass that one into the table, which then gets passed into Linux, and so Linux reuses U-Boot's device tree. So you only have a single device tree to maintain. One, not five, one. It's much easier and it's much more in the idea of the original inventors. <clears throat> so now that we've heard what's all in there, there's a lot of stuff missing, obviously, because you, you can't always invent the whole world at once. So what do we have missing in our implementation? Well, the first and foremost thing is, is your NVRAM support. So the runtime services, they, um, oh, wait. Uh, so usually when you have uh, runtime services running, um, Linux can use them to access your NVRAM while it is running, which means you need to have a device <laughs> dedicated to firmware that is not in use by Linux. Implementing that generically in U-Boot turned out to be really hard since um, a lot of these devices don't even have two storage devices that you can put things onto, right? Depends on your price point. Um, so I basically did not have any device there that I could store anything onto. Well, so we don't have that interface. Oh, sorry. Uh, we basically just don't have a boot order that you can change from, uh, from the operating system, which really in an embedded world you don't really care that much about because you have a static boot order that you pre-configure anyways and you're good. But if you want to implement it, it's definitely doable. All the stuffs are there, all the, the functionality to do runtime services and implement that. It's all in U-Boot. It's all generic and doable. You just need to find a device to carve out, make sure that Linux doesn't have access to it, and then implement the, feature, the, the pieces necessary to poke data into it. And then you're good. Another thing that's missing is, um, well, so we have this object thing, right? This, this bucket of lots of objects that um, we, uh, we provide to EFI binaries. Now, um, usually in an EFI world, a U, in a UEFI world, um, what you do is you initialize the firmware that creates all those interfaces and all those, those protocols and, and objects, and then you run some other binary, some other EFI binary, which, for example, in this case, is a ButterFS driver. And the ButterFS driver can then go in and add itself to that bucket of objects so that the next binary that you're running can use that object and do something with it. In U-Boot, we are recreating that bucket on every boot EFI execution. So yes, you can use your ButterFS driver. You can run it. It will add itself to the device, to the object bucket but the next time you're trying to execute anything else, it's gonna get removed because we're recreating that bucket. So this is one thing that we're um, that that is going to change sooner or later um, if we're finally starting to merge the 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 U boot object model with the U EFI object model, so that every U boot object becomes a U EFI object internally. Too many U's. Um, another thing that's missing is you, you have these objects, but apart from actual useful objects, um, I would say, like things that describe hardware and, and, and features that you want to talk to, um, you also have libraries in there. So you have a, an object that you can query that gives you a function callback blob with function pointers that do things like string len and string compare, if you really want to have those. Now, the EFI shell uses those. I don't know why. They don't just link things into their own binary, but um, apparently it was really cool to reuse code from Tiano Core, which we don't implement. So we don't have the EFI shell. Well, if 
you really cared, you might want to implement those protocols. I never cared about the EFI shell, so we don't have them. You have to use your own EFI blob in the end anyways, so the EFI shell isn't that much use. In case you ever saw it at all, um, it's not a great shell. <clears throat> so why do you want to do all of this? Right? I mean, you came here, you went all the way to, um, to look through all these slides. Um, why, why would you even remotely consider to use the UEFI booting path in uBoot? Well, there's a couple of reasons why, why it's interesting to at least think of the idea. Um, the, the most important one to me is the tenant separation. So you can have people that work on your hardware specifics in a completely different department, company, people, whatever. You can actually separate between people who care about your hardware specifics and people who care about your operating system specifics. They can be separate entities, which if you have a mesh together, I need to have my bootloader and my kernel and everything as one thing um, approach, that's really hard to, to implement. Also, one thing that I see happening a lot is that people add their value add on this side. Right? So if you want to suddenly implement, say, ButterFS boot support, you would go in and hack a ButterFS module into U-Boot, or you would do a lot of other fancy things down here. So you have a lot of, a lot of um, value add in, um, in, in the firmware side that really is not firmware specific or board specific, but more um, not, not operating system specific, not necessarily operating system specific, but um, approach specific. Like you, you want to you want to do something generically on your product line, but you want to do this for every single board. You want to have fallback boot on every board you have, right? But you don't want to necessarily have fallback boot implemented in on this side because it's it looks the same on every on every system that you have. So you really want to have it in your operating system, so you don't duplicate work. So what happens is that people um, start up with U-Boot here, and then they modify U-Boot until it doesn't look like a U-Boot anymore. <laughs> uh, or they go in and invent amazing scripts that are five kilobytes long and nobody can review and read anymore, and it, it just becomes a maintenance mess. Right? If you move them over to the operating system side, it usually becomes much more maintainable and scalable. Um, <clears throat> you can have even more fancy value add um, with an EFI application, so you can do graphics and all of that, right? You, you have full interfaces to it. Um, you can move your hardware underneath of your value add. So if you suddenly want to go for a system with a stock AMI firmware, well, there you go, just do it, right? It's the same interface. You don't ha you're not bound to necessarily always run on U-Boot. You can switch between different systems. Um, if you suddenly need to switch to a different architecture, well, go ahead and do it. It's all generic, right? The same code runs on your x86 system, on your ARM system. I've even seen a MIPS port of, of UEFI. You could do it there as well if you wanted to. And one day when I get around to it, I am going to write a mainframe port. Um, you can, for example, replace even more things. You can replace your operating system with a stock operating system, where it's, which is where, where I come into place again. Oh. Where I come into place again. There you go. I come into place again. Um, so this is what, what, what basically pays my bills at the end of the day. If you guys have the chance to use our code, it's a good thing for me because it pays my bills. Right. Um, or if you really wanted to, you can use non-Linux there because it's still the same interfaces. If your value add goes in before the FreeBSD loader, you just run the FreeBSD loader and it runs ahead. You, you don't, you're not bound to specific interfaces on how things work left and right. You, you finally have a chance to at least build on generic things on top of each other. Or if you really wanted to, um, you could use U-Boot as your operating system and just build a value add that only ever shows a cat running over the rainbow. Um, yeah, um, so, so that uh, you would never even run an operating system. You could write your bare metal operating system in a architecture and platform agnostic fashion. So why, why do you have to re-implement disk drivers to preload your five megabytes of payload every, on every single board? Don't do that. Just preload them generically and then go into your busy loop that just does whatever. 
There's, there's no point in, in re-implementing the wheel every single time, right? So with that, um, let me come to the first question. Um, secure boot. Uh, UEFI specifies exactly how secure boot works. It can, um, it can sign and verify every single piece of the chain. Uh, it's just not implemented in the U-boot right now because I particularly, personally, don't care all that much about the secure boot chain, um, but that's just a personal preference. All of the, um, the, the code is basically trivial to write. All you need to do is implement the secure boot protocol and make sure that your boot EFI also calls into it, and the rest will just automatically work because every bootloader that is certified as being secure boot compatible is already going to use your UEFI secure boot protocol to verify against whatever um, that you are secure. So you could probably even go and call U-Boot's internal shims to verify things and have all of secure boot implemented in, I don't know, 100 lines of code, 200? It should be trivial if you really wanted to. More questions? Sorry. So the question is, um, how, do we, how do we get from um, a firmware that is used to really go away completely um, once you boot into your kernel to a firmware that stays resident uh, to provide runtime services? What we have is um, we have a, a marker in the code, um, underscore, underscore, EFI underscore runtime um, that uh, you put into functions and variables that you need to have available during runtime services. And these are marked specifically in the EFI memory tables which get passed to Linux so that they don't get overwritten later on. And they also, so you also have to, the reason we don't just mark everything as runtime is that Linux can relocate your runtime code to any other location it likes in memory. So you basically need to have runtime relocation for every code that is runtime, runtime service capable. So we um, have this magic there that basically um, every variable that you would try to dereference needs to go through a special callback so that we can find it again. But it's, just look at the code. It's, it's much more explanatory if you look at it. Question is, does it move it in physical or virtual? Uh, it can do anything it like. It basically tells you, you, you were on address 5,000 before, go and play in, on two gigabytes. It can do anything, it just relocates you. The answer is yes, we do have some stuff that can persist because it's specially designed to be the same as the PSDI. So Tom just said that, yeah, yeah, right. The answer is yes, we have special persisting code. Um, similar to the PSCI code that also re persists itself because it has the same problem. It's running in EO3 and still uh, st stays alive during the lifetime of, of the operating system. Which, by the way, would be the way I would implement any runtime service. I would, anytime I would do a runtime service that is more complex, I would just make it be a PSCI call and then call into something that at least is aware that it stays in the same address space. It's much easier code to write. Um, yes? Yep. And maybe you know more. Um, this situation makes a lot of sense. You know, when you when you scale up. Okay. The problem is, is that I certainly hope you don't change Yubu and make it exclusively UEFI. No. Because eventually, you know, you're going to have to run across an all-winner chip in which you've got like a, a, a memory man, a power manager, uh, maybe a non-volatile RAM and a clock, and that's that's the extent of the hardware. The rest of the hardware is all user defined, you know, outside that, you know, my hardware, you know, which I'm, I'm using as devices. 
Okay, so the, 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 the comment was basically that A, um, people are afraid of using ACPI, which I completely concur, um, and B, uh, why would you want to have all of the overhead of this if you have a really small system, if I get that right? Um, for B, B is very easy to answer. I don't have current numbers, but back when I did the patches, um, the additional code overhead of having boot EFI support was 10 kilobytes of compiled code. 10 kilobytes on a 500 kilobyte binary. Negligible, it's basically less than, less than what the compiler difference would be between different compiler versions. Having that support in there is almost no runtime overhead and I mean definitely no runtime overhead if you don't use it and no runtime, almost no runtime overhead if you, even if you use it um, and no, almost no code overhead. So overhead wise there's basically nothing there. And ACPI, I personally don't see anybody implementing ACPI on this. Why, why would you? And even if you do implement ACPI, you would implement ACPI as a complement to a device tree based world. We have this so beautiful flow there where you can have U-boot have the same device tree as the kernel. Why would you want to break that up, really? I mean, this, this makes a lot of sense. Having ACPI is just an option. I, I don't like to block people into anything at all, right? It's, it's very frustrating when I see people dictating, say, you have to use UEFI, whatever. Um, and don't mean UEFI, but mean this specific implementation of UEFI by this specific company, right? Um, not, name, not calling names here. Um, kind of like System G. <laughs> this, this is built around the concept of choice, right? If you want to use it, go ahead and use it. I see very little reason not to do it. But if you do see reason not to use it, go ahead and don't use it. I don't, I don't mind. Um, but this also, keep, keep in mind that there's almost no overhead to it. Um, so we are one minute over. Um, if you're really quick. Uh, just PSCI, what is the relationship to that? I mean, can it list like side by side? It, it lives side. Okay, so question is uh, PSCI versus EFI. Um, PSCI lives in EL3, so it's, you basically have EL3, EL3, which is your on x86 speech SMM, then you have EL2, which is hypervisor, EL1, which is uh, your system mode, and EL0, which is user space. Um, all of this lives, the EFI runtime services live in, in, your, the same con in the same scope that your kernel lives in, so EL1 or EL2, depending on your kernel. Um, PSCI lives all in EL3. That's the difference. All right, awesome, so we are two minutes over. Thanks a lot.